Benji Cole, son of Al Cole from CBS Radio and host of People of Distinction. The talk that gives an in-depth view of some of the most dynamic, intelligent, and successful people on the planet. Run to our website, peopleofdistinction.org, for more info. Or you can always email me directly at benji at alcoholenterprises.com. And on the line with us today, we have Mary Hoagland. We're going to be discussing her impressive book, No, No, Nola Spicola Goes to Foster Care. We'll say that five times fast. I love that title, people. It's available for purchase through Amazon as well as barnesandnoble.com. And before we go any further, I want to take this opportunity and point out that Mary was brought to our network, People of Distinction, today by one of the best advertising firms in the business. And, of course, if you follow us, you already know I'm talking about City of Books. So listen to me. For my writers out there, if you have gone through your process, you have spent – a countless amount of hours, it seems, creating your masterpiece, and now you find yourself at a precarious position because, well, you know, now you need help moving the book you just finished writing. Well, I'm going to give you some fantastic advice. Contact City of Books. I'm telling you, they're one of the best in the business to do it, and this is exactly what they specialize in. So head on over to cityofbooks.com today and gather all of the ways that their fantastic team it's going to help you do just that. And listen, it is an absolute pleasure to have Mary here on the line. Now, right there in the title, well, people, there's no beating around the bush. Uh, you understand what we're discussing today. We're going to talk about foster care. And I think it's – this book is so impressive for so many reasons. But when we talk about foster care, a lot of times it's a discussion that we're having as adults. How often are we talking to children, especially, I mean, of course, the children that find themselves, unfortunately, in a foster care position, right? Nobody ever wants that for their children. But, you know, depending on the circumstances, it is ultimately the best route. But it can be a very confusing situation, being displaced from your home and finding yourself in unfamiliar territories and what that does to a psyche and to a child's psyche. This book is impressive because it's going to tackle a discussion that otherwise may seem almost a bit of taboo, right? May otherwise be a difficult one to go into. And listen, I'm going to I'm going to leave it there. I, I you know, you guys know me. I could talk, man, and I'll go on and on. But at the end of the day, this is not about me. It's about Mary and her wonderful book. And she's going to be able to articulate everything much better than I ever could. So do me a favor. Sit back and strap in. Mary, first and foremost, welcome to People of Distinction and thank you very much for being a guest. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you, Angie. Of course. Mary, listen, it is a true pleasure to have you here. I think what you're doing is very unique and very special because, again, when it comes to foster care, it, it almost is something that can seem like a very daunting conversation to have. And although – Although it's a it's a tough one to swallow, we understand that reality is reality, and there are a lot of children that find themselves in that predicament. So I love what you're doing in tackling this subject, and I love even more that you're here on the network to discuss it. So thank you very much for all of that. Before we jump into the book, I do think it's important to learn a little bit more about yourself. So Mary, let's start there. Tell us more about your background, please. Um, I was born in Virginia, Minnesota, which is on the Iron Range um, in northern Minnesota. I have an older sister, Missy, um, and two younger brothers, Michael and John. After I graduated from high school, I went to Bemidji State University, which is also in northern Minnesota, and received a social work degree with a criminal justice minor and a sociology minor also. Um, I married my husband, Eric, 32 years ago, and we have two adult children, Ruby Suzanne and Eric Andrew. And we had a, Sophie, our dog, was um, in our lives for 16 and a half years, and she passed just last April. So but sorry. she got to know Nola well, you know, as well as we did while she was here. Mm -hmm. um, part of my background is that I was a probation officer 
for 30 years. I started out as a juvenile probation officer, and then I moved on to an adult felony caseload. Um, about seven years ago, I retired, and I would highly recommend it, Jamie. I, you, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to be retired. And I started doing things that were just kind of fun. And about three to four years ago, I became a volunteer goat farmer at a place called Great River Ranch in Bina, Minnesota. And Melissa Younger is the owner of the farm, and she has taught me an amazing amount of information about goats, about chickens, about um, alpacas. Um, she needed someone to milk her goats while she was going to be out of state, and I volunteered to do that, and as a result became a, a goat foster parent also. And you take the goats into your home, bottle feed them, um, and help them to you know, be able to get back to their family. Mm -hmm. And then as a result of my first bottle, Baby Nola, I wrote a children's book about her. Love that. You know, people, you know that old adage where you learn something new every day? Well, we've learned so much, and we've just started this thing, and I love it. You know, first and foremost, Mary has a beautiful family that she has constructed around her, and nothing but continued success to you and all of your loved ones, but also Virginia, Minnesota. Maka, am I the only one that has never heard? Of, of Virginia, Minnesota. I didn't realize that there was a Virginia in Minnesota. I just thought of the state. That is, that's, you know, my own little uh, the side here. But that is incredible. And, and there really is a Bemidji, Minnesota, too. Yeah, I was <laughs> going to mention that one, too, because that was a very uh, interesting name, although I couldn't remember exactly. So thank you for, for, for mentioning it again. <laughs> People, I'm sorry, the names of places are, are fascinating. This is wonderful. We could do a show just on that. I mean, that's incredible stuff here. Mary, welcome to the show again, and thank you for all of that. And my mind is going wild because I'm already piecing things together and starting to see some correlations between your book and also your background. But rather than speculate, because you know what happens when you assume, I'm going to move on to the next one, and I'm just going to go directly to the source. Mary, talk to us about what inspired you to become an author. I actually um, planned on writing a book eventually about my probationers, some mm -hmm. of the funny things they did, some of the you know, not so um, smart things that they did, and it was I, I was looking forward to doing that. I, I kind of collected some stories well during my 30 years and still have the information, and I may at some point do it, but it kind of changed focus when I um, met Nola, you know, and met um, Melissa. But I was always going to write a book, and it just happened to turn into a children's book. Yeah. Well, listen, we are very glad that it did. And without further ado, the anchor is all about that beautiful goat, Nola. Let's talk about the book. No, no, Nola Spicola goes to foster care. Tell us a little bit more about it. Well, the, the thing I'd like to readers to know is that my illustrator um, is also my aunt. She was a mm. retired art teacher, and she her name is Mary Lind, and she married my uncle many, many years ago. And... When I decided to write this book, I, I could have had the company's illustrators um, do that for me, but I decided that I would pay my aunt um, separately because she yeah. just does beautiful work. She's done um, portraits of our, our dogs um, that look exactly look like a photograph of our dogs. And so wow. I thought this would be a really good opportunity, not only for me, if this book went well, but also for Mary, um, because she, it, they're just amazing. They're, they're the kind of, um, she do, did them all in watercolor. And then she, I, I own the, you know, the originals, mm -hmm. but it's just not Melissa and a goat or me and a goat or my husband and a goat. It's eight goats in the picture. There's, you know, four chickens or ten chickens. I mean, there's so many different things and so many fun things to look at in this book. I, I, I don't know that I've ever 
I read a lot to my kids when they were growing up, and I don't think I've ever seen such a beautifully illustrated book. She kind of carried me along with the things um, <laughs> with what she did. But basically what the book is about is it promotes a positive view of foster care, and it shows how foster care kind of bridges the gap to unifi- unification and change mm-hmm. in families. Nola's... Uh, a goat, but she's also a kid. That's what a baby goat is called. And she's just in an un- unfortunate circumstances, and it's not her fault. There's no, you know, no fault in a 3.8 baby, 3.8 pound baby um, having any any fault in, in her situation. Um, her mother loves her, but she's unable to care for her. And it started to kind of parallel with some of the situations that I had had while I was working, you know, the more time she was here, um, the more I realized that that there was a huge parallel in how foster care works for goats as well as how foster care works for children. And it's just a place for them to be safe and cared for and kept clean and, and, you know, people modeling behaviors um, until the home situation um, improves. There is so much more, um, so many people that are, are in situations where they were placed in foster care, and you, you touched on this earlier, and they were in foster care. They had no idea why. No one ever explained anything to them. They blamed themselves for placement. Sometimes it's one child that goes, which was what happened in Nola's case. There were three, um, three babies born. She was one of a triplet, and Nola was chosen by... Um, by Melissa to leave the home. The mother couldn't feed all three of the children. And so she picked Nola to go into foster care because she was just a beautiful, special um, goat. I mean, she the, her coloring is just gorgeous. And it she so she went to, to our house. Um, and like I say, there's so many it, family issues that are generational, um, multiple reasons. There's abuse, trauma, pre, um, PTSD, low self-esteem, all kinds of things that could have been avoided if there had been, they had been better informed about their situation. And that's one of the reasons that I, I wrote it down. Mm-hmm. You know, Mary, quick reflection here. And I, I love what you're talking about because, again, as I – as my team and I were doing research in preparation for today's interview. And of course, we came around your background as a parole officer and a probation officer. I can't help but to speculate between children that find themselves in foster care. And again, we've mentioned it. You just talked about the confusion that comes with it. If it's not articulated to them properly, what that does to their psyche and ultimately, and, and again, it's not a one-size-fits-all. There are plenty of nuances to it. But people that then find themselves committing crimes later on in life and find themselves in unfortunate circumstances being locked up and in trouble with the law. And really, if again, my psychology background, even though I don't have a psychologist, I took Psych 101, so now I'm a therapist. No, the psychologist in me looks at that, and, and I'm finding a correlation between – Certain individuals that find themselves potentially in foster care that haven't been vetted, right, that haven't been talked to and and understood and hold that with them and how that could potentially be a domino effect to decisions that they make later on in life. And I think that's why so your book is so important to be the catalyst, to be the precipice for that conversation, I think is so valuable. That is just one side of things, but it's a reflection that I I had to make because I think there's a connection and something that is valuable there to really be, to be talked about. And and again, cannot be overstated. I love what you're doing here. My follow-up question, is that title? I mean, I'm piecing it together, but I love it. (laughs) Okay. No, no, no less Spicola goes to foster care. Talk to us about that title, Mary, and and really why you chose it to be the representation for your book. Before I do that, um, Jimmy, can I comment on what you just said about the criminal behavior? I, we, we did what are called pre-sentence investigations. It's it's like you do kind of a social history of a person and kind of look at what their needs are, Mm -hmm. you know, while they're on probation. 
And I'll never forget the time this young girl came into my office and she had committed a crime. And I, one of the questions I asked her was, what was life like growing up in your family? And she said, what do you mean? And I said, well, did you have enough food? Did you have clothing? Were people, you know, there for you? Yeah. And she said, oh, we had plenty of food, but we just didn't have anybody there to, to cook it. She said, I learned to cook at five years old. Mm. And I, my parents were never home, and they were both had addiction issues. And she said, and then I got really tired of being a parent at 11, and so I knew that the only way I could get out of there was to commit a crime. Wow. And th those are some of the, the horror stories that children are living in yeah. these days. And it's it's a very sad, sad situation. And, and I... Um, I did have a social work um, background, and um, I probably was more social worky than I was probation off. You know, the punitive kind of thing. They used to mm -hmm. call me the social worker at work. But just understanding the dynamics of what people are living in, and so many people just can't even grasp. I, I mean, I couldn't grasp it. I, you know, grew up in a home where there was plenty of food, and you know, my family was intact until I was an adult, mm -hmm. and. Um, it just, it's very sad, some of these situations that, yeah. that we ran into and that are happening. So I can't imagine what social workers here, you know, right. the ones that are doing the placements. Yeah. But they don't understand or they need to leave because they can't do what they're doing. And it's one of those, those stories I'll never forget. You know, it's just. I just found that one to be very, very sad. Yeah, so, oh, of course. Anyway, I will go on to the title. Um I know Nola was kind of naughty at times and she would um, she, when she was in the house she had to have a diaper on because they don't like small children they don't have control um, and so she needed to have a diaper on when she was in the house and she needed a onesie on to hold the diaper on you know onto the uh, on her body yeah. and she would jump from the chair to the couch to the computer table, grab a piece of paper off of there, run across the back of the couch and go back to her chair and look at you as she was chewing up your um, report that you just finished typing. <laughs> so, so she was just kind of, and so it was started with things like, no, 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 you know, or she'd find the flower bed and she'd be chomping away and it was always, no, no, you know, no, 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 Nola. And she just kind of got that, that nickname because she, she almost kind of smiled at you when she was doing it. She was having so much fun. And then the Spicola part, I have no idea. It was kind of one of those rhyme time things where mm -hmm. um, she was out. Her and my dog were chasing squirrels outside, and I yelled Nola, you know, to get her to come, and she was totally ignoring me. And I, I, I just, it just came out Nola Spicola, and she came running right to me. So she ended up her her actual registered name is No No Nola Spicola. So we call her No No, we call her Nola, we call her Nola Spicola, we just sometimes call her Spicola. So it's it and she went to foster care. <laughs> so it was kind of a simple um simple way of coming up with the name, I guess. Right. I love it. I absolutely love it. You know, listen, Mary, you're making me want a goat, okay? And here in Los <laughs> Angeles, where I live, I don't know if that would be appropriate, but I, you know, I kind of want a goat. You can't just get one goat. You have to get two. <laughs> <laughs> you can never just get one. <laughs> well, yeah, well, you know, me, I'll talk to my wife about it. Let's see. Christmas is around the corner. We'll see. No, um, this is a beautiful <laughs> thing. Listen, Mary, as we start to, to close out, I'm curious what you would say for this next one, but I, I have what I envision in my mind as your intended reader, but who would you say is your intended reader for the book? You know, I think it's a book for everyone. It's a book for foster children who need to know that it's not their fault. It's for non-foster children that are going to school with these kids that need to know that it's not their fault. Um, I think it's for therapists can you that use this book in you know in therapy in play therapy um in, you know counselors small children can like i said before they can just count you know you can teach counting with them because it's such a beautifully illustrated book i, I can't say enough about mary lynn's work mm -hmm. um and i guess 
yeah, it's fun, it's entertaining, it's educational, it's, you know, there's awareness, and it, it shows that it's not your, not the children's fault. So anyone can read this book. And I think that um, hopefully they're going to catch how much NOLA, you know, became a part of our family because she, like I say, it's like having a little puppy that you have to have a diaper on because they they don't smell, they don't, she slept in a, in a um, portable crib next to our bed when my when my husband came she came into the house she walked in my husband said she's going to be in a cage down the basement I opened the door she had like a Under Armour onesie on it was the cutest thing <laughs> and he he was sitting on the couch and I just set her down and she's 3.8 pounds and she turned and looked at him and goats don't goats don't walk for the most part they dance and she just danced over to to him on the couch and he picked her up and he was like oh my god oh my oh oh no oh oh my oh and he went out and bought her a pack and play the next day for the the portable crib the next day for her and it's i like say i think it's for everyone and i think that it's a good book it really is especially the illustrations and it has a good message and i i also think it's for people to realize that how blessed they are to have foster parents open their homes and their hearts and their lives because it's not an easy job. You know, we fed her every two hours. You know, you they're very insecure. They don't know what's going on. There's just so many dynamics yeah. in having kids have to leave their home. Mm-hmm. Can I add one more thing? Absolutely. Really quick. Nola's going to be a mom. <laughs> so then, yes. So I'm so excited to see how that plays out, you know, um, and what future books we can get from her now becoming a parent. This book is so valuable for so many reasons, a lot of which has been discussed already. But uh, one thing that keeps coming up in my mind is the importance of empathy. Because listen, you know. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You don't understand what someone else is truly going through. And listen, I, as I mentioned before, the foster care system is nuanced, right? And there are a lot of exceptional, exceptional people that open their doors. Yep, of absolutely. course, like in any situation, right, there's some bad apples that, that, that get in there. But for the most part, I mean, listen, these these people are heroes, right? I mean, it's that old adage, like, not all heroes wear capes. Well, foster care parents are heroes. And there's so much. This book showcases things in one way. And it's just one snapshot on one particular family with their <laughs> just adorable goat. But it symbolizes something very important. And again, if we could utilize a little more empathy and understanding to the plight of others and and just having conversations, imagine the world that we could potentially be in. You know, and and you know, I'm I'm diving down the rabbit hole now, but as a parent myself, I look at the world and where we currently are, and I feel like I sound like my parents now, right? Where I'm, I'm looking at the world and I'm, <laughs> yep. I'm, I'm in fear, and I'm thinking of, whoa, my goodness, what is going on? And I don't know how yep. it happened, but I've become my parents. And mm-hmm. this book, again, even though it's about this one story, it's about no, 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 less Bacola, it helps you envision so much and that's just what i've done in this short 20 minute conversation imagine what it's going to do for you when you head on over to amazon barnes and noble and you purchase copies for yourself this is something that needs to be on everybody's shelf pick up copies for yourself get copies for other people as a gift christmas is right around the corner i'm telling you this is something special that you want to be a part of you know where you got to go, people, okay? You got Mary Hoagland to thank her for all of it. Head on over there today. Get lost in it. Mary, this has been a true pleasure. I, I truly mean it. An absolute honor. Thank you once again for being a guest on People of Distinction. 
Thank you. You you get it. You I really appreciate everything that you've said.